CodeBuddies.org live coding session. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today we'll be working on the Western Friend website. We have been porting this website over from Django, or sorry, from Drupal to Django and Wagtail CMS. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Western Friend, it is the official publication of Quakers in the Pacific and North Pacific and Intermountain Yearly Meetings. And it's a small independent organization, uh, nonprofit. It's been publishing an online m magazine for, well, I think at least around 10 years as Western Friend. I'm not sure the um, issues we have on the website go back 2013, but I think it had some additions before that. Prior to being Western Friend, it was known as Friends Bulletin. And those issues date back to 1929, paper newsletter. Those are all digitized on the Internet Archive. You can read them directly on the Western Friend website. It has this page turner animation thing. Or you can read the full contents directly on the Western Friend. Oh, sorry, on the Internet Archive. <laughs> it's getting towards the end of the day here. I'm a little bit tired. I have my decaf chai tea. Sweet chai. So what we're going to work on today is this deep archive feature. The Internet Archive, by the way, is an excellent organization. Archive.org, if you've got a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. Um, it's been it started by archiving the internet, that's the name, taking snapshots of web pages as they change over time, going back to the mid-90s in some cases. Then they expanded their scope, and now they offer hosting for, I think, millions of texts, full text works of books from Project Gutenberg and other libraries have contributed, videos, audio, and even old software that you can actually run right in the in an archive browser, old software that's been compiled, I think, to WebAssembly or something, as well as now images. Not only does it host archival media, you know, that's just from popular collections, like I think Prelinger and other things like that, but you can host your own media here as well, particularly if you're willing to grant it to the public under a Creative Commons license. So you can create a library card and just upload your own whatever you're working on, photography or videos or music projects for free. And you can link and embed those in your website, things like that. It's really cool what the Internet Archive is doing. They took the entire archive of Friends Bolton issues, um, essentially several, I think, boxes, physical boxes containing these newsletters going back to 1929. Um, Mary Klein, the editor of Western Friend, dropped those off at the Internet Archive headquarters in San Francisco. And over the course of a couple of months, they digitized the entire collection free of charge and now host it. And it's even been sort of translated by optical character recognition. So you can search within it. Let's see if we go to school. There we go. I hit enter. If I search for school, which I saw here. There's only a couple times that word appears in this particular issue, but you can see it, it even highlights the word on the PDF. It's really remarkable. These are old print p newsletters uh, with varying font styles and everything else, and uh, some like coffee stains, and it's crazy. But anyway, okay, so that's what we're working on. Uh, in our Drupal website, we have this interactive interface, and similarly with the, um, let's see, what was the address here? I have to remember now. Magazine Archive. I think this is the URL I had chosen. Yeah, so I've, I've got a basic um, thing working here on the local host. Now I'm having troubles with the table of contents, getting that to work, but we've got the iframe embed and a back end data model. 
Hmm. I just realized that, uh, well, not just, but in a, over the course of the last week, having uh, taken a little break from this project and worked on a couple more, that I realized our data model is a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Let me open that up real co quick here in the, the library. No, we're not in the library. We're in magazine models. Get out pie. Um, when you're editing the content, you enter the title of the, the issue, and this is the Internet Archive identifier. That's what allows us to get the iframe and embed the object. These, uh, these uh, identifiers are unique and across the Internet, Internet Archive. Wow. I will be able to talk. Um, in a couple of other fields, the place where we're having some troubles is um, we want that table of contents to display along the top. And if we look a little bit closer at this, it consists of three main elements, which is basically it's a repeating item with three elements, an article title, an author, and a page number. And that page number, there's actually two page numbers. One is the page number that's printed in the PDF, but the other one is the page number for this page turner widget to work. Um, the numbers printed on the PDF don't always correspond to the, uh, I think, zero-based numbering that the PDF uses. Sometimes the table of contents in the front of the newsletter would not be included in the page numbering and it might start afterwards, so we just have to treat those a little bit different. So when I tried to build a consistent user interface, like a cohesive thing where you enter the issue information and then create uh, more or less a table of contents, um, I ended up, I don't know if it was a naive path, but um, just a complicated, going down a complicated path. So I created, <laughs> well, let's go up a level. So I, I created, archive issue which is this main top level thing so each issue has its own page that you can view it on and it renders the table of contents at the top of the page uh, then we needed to link one or more articles to it to generate the table of contents and those articles have one or more uh, yeah basically one or more authors which is just really tricky <laughs> I'll just give it that uh, so these are twice nested fields, and the way it renders in the user interface is just, I would say, kind of garbage. It's just not very usable. So there is an open bug on Wagtail. This is a very, uh, you know, this is an edge case. This is not a very common pattern in Wagtail site design, so I can see why this would be a little bit neglected. Uh, and overall, my experience with Wagtail has been like top notch, the usability, the developer experience, it's very great, very polished. And then when we find a little um, that room for improvement, uh, the developers have been very quick to acknowledge that and, and even make those fixes, make those, cha make those changes. And I haven't contributed myself to the Wagtail core, but I am learning more about it. So the more I learn about it, the more I would be able to actually, you know, fix something else I see. But this issue is a little bit more complicated than I'm able to grasp right now. In any case, I'll try to flow around it. I don't know um, when this will be fixed, and I don't want our project to be kind of held up waiting for an arbitrary um, release. It could be the next version of Wagtail, or, you know, I, don't, I just have no idea. That said, Wagtail has this other cool feature which we're really not using in our project called the stream field. And let's see, I just want to be able to get back to the struct block here in a second. This. But what a stream field is, is it lets you put little blocks of content together. And let's see if there's a picture of it on the Wagtail website, is the best picture I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, it looks, kind of, looks like this basically you, you define a page model and then you add little elements to the page. They can be titles, they can be paragraphs of text, image embeds. Um, it looks like a line, a lined image, meaning you can, you know, float it left or float it right. Um, you can add buttons and callouts and pull quotes, anything you could really imagine. And these are all just sort of HTML templates that can repeat in your user interface. So that's what we're going to try today: is swapping out this sort of inelegant uh, approach and overly complicated uh, data model with something more simpler and a little bit more progressive. Um, I, I said this in the last stream, but these 
archive articles, they don't really need their own page. They don't need to be their own entity, to be honest. We're not displaying them in any way except to populate this table of contents. So that seems like it's ideally fit, uh, fit for our stream field. So that said, I'm in a branch, so if I, yeah, if I, you know, if it doesn't work out, then we'll just we'll get back into it. Hey, what's up, Sure86? How are you protecting your user data in Django? Um, let's see, by protecting, do you mean keeping it safe from leaking or a data breach or something like that? Is that what you're meaning? Basically, I'm, if that, I'm not sure if that's exactly what we mean, but um, one thing we're doing is not collecting a lot of personally identifiable information. So in the U European Union, are you from Europe? There's this um, general data protection, GDPR regulation or rules. And one of the, it has some several guidelines, one of which is just, if you don't need the data, don't collect it. It's called data minimization. So we start there. Um, Django, you know, then another thing you do with personally identifiable data is it should be encrypted when it's at rest, meaning when it's like in the database. Uh, but since we don't have much personally identifiable data, we're not implementing any encryption, any server side encryption here. Mm. So yeah, I haven't specifically looked at user data protection in Django. I'm sure there's a guide to it or something. Security, so there's basically security principles. Here's managing GDPR in Django. So that's a cool one. Mm, let's see. Okay, so yeah, you have, well, essentially this is cool that you brought it up even. You identify any personally identifiable information with a privacy meta called the Django GDPR Assist. Let me pop this in the um, chat. I think this is what you're asking about is how we protect personally identifiable information, right? So let's see. So we've got a model defined here and we've got a user. We define a custom model, so that means we're adding some extra fields to the user that don't ship. Now, the Django default user model does include it includes a first name and a last name field. So right there, you've got personally identifiable information, enough to identify a, a unique person. Um, so then, when you're defining your model, you can define a subclass called privacy meta, and you tell it which fields are private. Um, and then you can define a, a function that will allow you to anonymize it. Hmm. So then, yeah, it gives you a management tool to scrub the personal information. Huh. And, you know, handle GDPR right to be forgotten requests, which actually we're in the midst of one where I work. We've been working on this GDPR right to be forgotten request for almost two months now. It turned into a big old problem. So it's good that you bring that, comp that, uh, <laughs> Concept up, sure. I'm not sure if you're here anymore, but uh, essentially, when you have a production system and the CTO says, Well, our system's not designed to forget people, um, that means you either sort of tell the user we can't expunge your data, or you have, which is, I think, it's basically illegal, or you have to do the infrastructure work to make that possible and it took it's taken us like two months to do some infrastructural work uh, with much more complicated infrastructure than our this little Django project it requires um, this thing's this Django project is just gonna run in a docker container but we're using like AWS and s3 and all sorts of stuff in my my day job so it's much di more, much more difficult so yeah thanks for bringing it up I will keep this behind my ear so that we can have integrity Django, oops, Django, privacy meta, Django privacy meta object, very cool. 
Boom. I'll paste that there in the chat in case you're still here, and I will also take note of it. That's one thing, though, I'll take a step back and say working in the Django and Python ecosystem has been like this. It's somebody comes to you with a question about how, or you're trying to figure out how do I implement this? And somebody's already had that problem, implemented it and shared it as a package. When basically the community has a mentality of sticking around and building on something and not just abandoning it for the next new shiny thing, uh, you can get to high levels of, of uh, capability, high levels of abstraction and usability, very good developer experience. So uh, I just really hope that we can collectively, uh, the developer community can collectively just um, build up not, rather than just stro st through, strewing things around and bike shedding and all this good stuff that's going on in the JavaScript ecosystem particularly, but there's also a little bit of that in Python ecosystem, I'm sure others as well, it's not immune to it. Okay, what we're gonna do here is remove a couple models. This is the destructive act. We will not need the art archive article author or the archive article, but I will want these fields. So what I'm gonna do is just cop comment it out and I will clean the code up in a little bit. And then I'm gonna run this migration make migration and it should pick up that we've uh, removed and then we, that we've removed these models but also I have to check for any relation so this right here the archive issue still has a relation and is still looking for archive articles so let's go ahead and get rid of that We deprecated all of those, removed them all, cleaned up the data. Oops. Run server. Very cool. Well, it looks like we had one drive-by question. <laughs> but that was a good one. That was a really good question. So I'm glad for that. Got to work on the lighting here a little bit. It's get gets dark here, and then when my... Screen content changes the lights shift. I'm trying to fix that a little bit so it's more steady state illumination. Probably some meta object. And I should tell Mary about this because she would enjoy knowing about that as well. so I can stay focused. I'm getting a little bit tired. I'll try to be relatively brief. I'm not going to do a two or three hour session today, I don't think. So what we want to do is add a stream field to this archive issue. Uh, if I refresh the in interface here now, we should, oh, I'll have to double check something. Yeah, now we see the archive issue just has the title, internet archive um, identifier, this weird volume field. I'm not sure what that's used for, and it's also marked as required. I should and then a publication date. We're using this calendar widget. I might actually swap this uh, calendar out for uh, another one that allows us to more easily traverse decades because um, a lot of these people's, a lot of these issues at least, you know, are going back decades. And then we have another part of our website where we're handling dates of birth, which is another person identifiable information, piece of information, but that's in, with regards to a memorial uh, of someone who has passed, so it might not be as uh, strict of data protection requirements there but all this is food for thought in any case we want to add their birth date uh, which these people a lot of times live many decades and be memorialized on our website and community here you can see 1918 we want to have like a little bit of a biography to honor the people in our community uh, so that's a previous um, feature we've built in this live stream. We'll probably swing back around to it and make some small improvements, but right now we're working on the deep archive. So let's go back to this struct block. So, uh, or I could start at the top, just so people do 
8.7.1, who haven't seen this before. I'm not really super familiar with it either. But basically, so you define a, a, a custom page if you're making a blog or whatever you're doing, we're making a deep archive. You add some fields to it and you add this one field type called a stream field, which is just like a, an array or a list of sub content, pictures, videos, whatever it is that you're wanting to allow the people to input. In this case, they're allowing them to add a little header level and a paragraph and images. So basically kind of create, it's creating a blog page. So those are common blog elements. And then you just render the stream field panel with that field. So we'll just do the similar thing. Now that if you notice that these stream field elements, they're kind of atomic, they're each their own little thing, uh, like a character block or a rich text block or an image chooser. We have a composite um, thing. Um, it's, um, I guess composite is the right word there. It consists of three things, archive, uh, sorry, an article title, an author, and a page. So for that, we're gonna define a struct or a structure that has some, and you can see how many of these widgets there are, the baseline, the basic um, primitive types, raw HTML, rich text editor, date, time, time, date. So you can do those individually. Boolean, so you can have checkboxes, URLs, regex for whatever you're doing reads up for. I guess to make sure somebody inputs some text that validates, like a credit card number or a library card number. Decimals, floats. So you can handle currencies correctly, perhaps with the decimal field, emails, text box, lots of good stuff. You can choose your own adventure here. Embedding multimedia from different websites is very cool. And now let's get down here. Sorry for the scroll blindness if it's going by too fast. But we're gonna add a structural content block. So it's possible to find a new block types made up of sub blocks person block consisting of sub blocks for first name and surname and image, in which case we'd have person identifiable information and would need to be able to expunge that. Very cool. Now you got me thinking. <laughs> That's the important part of doing these live streaming sessions. I'm almost out of tea. I think I will make another pot of tea real quick. So I will be right back. All right, the water's brewing. So I want to make sure that I'm not obscuring this documentation with my video over there. But basically what we're going to do is going to define a class here. And I suppose this would be defined under its own so like blocks.py or something like that. Yeah, just to keep things organized. I don't know if that's the convention, but I'm going to do that. Oh boy. Or a struct block, or just going to put it. blocks. Good. So this would be. Deep, deep archive article. Or archive. What was the convention I used over here? Archive article would be fine. So it's going to consist of a few fields, and we're going to get those fields from blocks. So first is the title, article title. Uh, 
The cool thing about this is you don't have to define a max length or anything like that, it looks like. It does have that property, but you can have none, so just unlimited length, I guess it'll store it as JSON or something. Interesting. Title. And the authors is going to be a page chooser block because we want to use our common authors bucket. Mm. Oh yeah, this could be a little bit tricky. We have multiple authors, so this would be a stream field within a stream field. I think so. If that's possible, should be possible. So how do we just define a regular old stream field? Let me see if there's another block type here, like a list block or something. Float block, regex, URL, boolean, t uh, time, date, time, rich text, raw HTML, choice. So we will want this page chooser block. We'll remember that. But we want a uh, list block. Many sub blocks, all of the same type. Sounds good. I should probably should have just tried typing it. In any case, what you do is consistent of blocks. And this is a page chooser block. So you can have multiple authors. Wow, this is crazy. If this is going to work, I will be really excited. And the water's boiled, so let me go and start my tea. I will be right back. Okay, do not inhale the turmeric, ginger, and lemongrass tea bag. Bad, bad stuff is gonna happen. All right, we got a title, we got author's field. And what well, we have those two pages. So we have to have the, um, I think it was PDF page and TOC page, or table of contents page, right? So let me just double check how I named them here. Talk page and PDF page, yeah. Makes sense. So these will just be, I think, just positive integers. Uh, equals blocks. Integer block. Table of contents page number and PDF, PDF page number here. Come on. Now we're gonna have, I just migrated those. Um, old fields out, so we're gonna have to clean up the template a little bit, and then figure out how to render a stream item, how to iterate over items in a stream field. Learning journey. Yeah, so that's about it. 
Ooh, and then we get to add icons if we want an icon. Maybe. I don't see why not. Uh, I did try adding uh, font, Wagtail Font Awesome last time, and it wasn't working for some strange reason. I could try that again, but I believe that Wagtail um, Icons has a decent one already for this particular use case. Oh boy, that's really small. How do I just do the image? Mm. So an article would be something like, like one of these would be fine or, yeah, I think that'd be fine. Doc full inverse. Let's add it, let's add a little meta, meta to it. Well then, doc full. All right, now I think I have to, uh, well, actually we haven't even attached it to the model yet. So we define this block. We'll import it in our models file. So from blocks. Import, what did I call it again? Archive article. There we are. Now I'll add a field. Where's my outline? It's maybe easier to get there. Strable model, deep archive index page, collapse that. Archive issue. We'll add a field for like table of contents, I guess. Now they're importing it here. I have to get the stream field. Let me just do this definition. I'll do my imports in a minute. So you just run the stream field method and you pass it in a list of all the sub stream field types. We're really only wanting one subtype. So we're actually, I should have done the list first. It's a list of one or zero, but I don't believe in zero based indexing. It's got one item in it, right? Length is one. You start counting at one in real life. Hey, level two. Welcome and welcome to lurk mode. All right. <laughs> this will just be called article. Ah, sorry, we need a tuple. So we have a list of tuples. Article. Can I capitalize it? I think so. Can you tell it what type of? block you want. And I imported the archive article block right here. And then I would have to invoke it and trailing comma and import stream field. From what I did I already get that? Let's see. I tried a cool plugin for VS Code last time that's supposed to auto resolve my imports, but it was just not working. I think it had something to do with that. I'm running poetry, I couldn't find the virtual environment. Dude, I got a little bit of a headache from inhaling that tea bag. Mm. So I think it's a wagtail core fields stream field. Mm -hmm. Now what's the difference between a stream block and a stream field? Ooh. This is cool. Exploratory wagtail stream block. Boing. Oh, it's just a distract I already imported from that. I should have. Well, that's kind of weird. Hmm. Oh, no, here it is. Stream block. A block consisting of a sequence of sub blocks of different types, which can be mixed and reordered at will. Oh, dude. I 
I don't remember, but this might be useful in other parts of our project if I've had reorderable stuff. Man, I should have been using this from the get go. Got to know your tools so you know when to use them. Wow, very cool. So there's a struct block there, which I'm doing. So they're just defining a stream block, and I'm defining a struct block. Because, because, this isn't, hmm, I don't know, screw it, I'm getting now confused. But it's very powerful, Wagtail. It's very powerful. And then we'll have to then do this in a minute. All right, so there we go. I think if I now need to migrate it in, I don't know, it should be optional, it's true, I suppose. I don't know otherwise what it default would be for a stream field. refresh the page it actually won't see anything as long as I don't see yellow text I'm happy all right the reason we don't see anything yet is I haven't added this now I have to tell hmm, to page I have to tell it to render the content page the field panel four and actually they didn't use field panel they used stream field panel didn't they stream field panel I think it was See, where did I import field pal from? Admin, edit handlers. There it is. And heck, I'm going to, oh, what do I got here? Paste, table contents. Small detail. field panel panel for table contents right you just put the old uh second well let's refresh the page now so this doesn't require migration all I've told Wagtail to do is just render another panel it will automatically generate this form for us we just tell it what of uh, the fields and it'll render them that order you know Internet Archive identifier the title one is coming from the page so the title one comes uh, by default so let's refresh and see if it works. So we got a table of contents article. I can add articles underneath of it. That makes sense. Now what does it look like? It's looking a lot better. Uh, it's pretty big, but the thing is you can add multiple art Arthur's authors. Sir Arthur. Uh, community people, for example. Mary Klein. Come on. And then 
use a page. It's not super intuitive, but there it is. Um, let me just do a test here. January 1st, 1929, Friends Bulletin 01, Unset 2. I think that's the same one. Yeah, Friends Bulletin 01, Unset 2. All right. Again, that's just an internal identifier generated by the Internet Archive. I will just go ahead and test the page turner mechanism. <clears throat> Excuse me. By grabbing one of these titles, pasting it in here. Oops, pasty. Oh, I didn't even copy it. My fingers are all twisted up. And then, I don't know, let's just do these different. So the table of contents page is what displays, like 1,000. That's not right. PDF page number, though, should be four-ish. We'll find out now if I publish this. As I view live, we should now see a screaming error. No, no error. Thanks. That's good. But we don't see a table of contents. Let's edit now the template so we can display that field. And then I will delete those. So when we're looking at an archive issue, we're actually looking at a deep archive issue. That's no, no. I'm wrong. We're calling it an archive issue, so that's yeah. It's a little bit confusing, but all right. So what we're going to try to do is for article in page articles all i don't know if i need the all it's not necessarily a query query set and i use the same field numbers so that should more or less work i guess this might work and it's not a super elegant approach. No, it didn't work. Let's just see if we can get some data in there. Something to render four times. So I'm, no, I know I'm iterating over something. So no, no, um, not iterating over anything. Oh, okay, so page articles. Let's double check this. I'll close a couple tabs. I mean, more or less, we're just giving a different alias than block. Um, oh, I didn't call it articles, did I? I called it table of contents. Maybe that's not super... For article and page table of contents? I don't know, actually. Makes sense. So we'll refresh it this time. There we go. Now we've got a page. There we've got some content. So there's one. I added one deal. So I'll just clean up that test. And now what I'm going to do is probably make this a lot more elegant and usable. So um, first I'll just get the text into the template. And I believe I'll just use a template. Uh, sorry, a table with a small button and you click the button, it'll change you there. See where it says Mary Klein, that is cool. So instead of an order list, we'll use a table, a slim table. We'll call it article authors. That'll be a tricky one if there's multiple authors. Well, anyway, we'll check it. We'll cross that bridge. So let's see here. Why did it do that indentation? That's kind of ugly. my bootstrap classes. So 
So each of these will display in a row. I'll put the class there. That way the row, you can click the whole row. We have a data attribute there, which enables the page turner to work. Actually, I think I need this whole thing. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. We need both of those data points, I suppose. I can't remember why. We need the identifier. TD to actually display the article title. That seems to be working correct. So we clean that up. Then looks like the author page is not working, but if I do title, that should work. So put a TD around it. Clean up the little bit of markup there. All right, you have to. No, I have to loop over authors here. See how this looks. Give the students refresh. Yeah. Uh, put my loop inside the table. Table. Let me check my table markup. Probably just doing something naive here. You should have a TR on the TH. W3 schools. Table TR. TH, TH, TH. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm doing wrong. Then these TDs are THs. Makes sense. Two table, well, we have one table of consisting of headers. It's unfortunate it won't. Well, let's see how I do this. No control. What was it? Not all of them, though. Damn it. Okay, we got our TR, TR here. That one's taking me stretch. I'll be right back. Let me just try taking these classes off, see, see if I got just, I think I've got something messed up here. Make sure my markup is correct. So each of these article will get to table row. 
And then you got table data, table data, table data. Should work. It's all inside of the table. Let me just stop the server running, I think. Something's funny here because shouldn't be shouldn't be rendering these labels, should it? Maybe that's how stream field blocks work. I'll have to read the docs a little bit closer. Let's take a look at that. Check the markup here. See, I think these classes weren't the problem, although they are pretty freaking hard to read. Oh, it's rendering in a dictionary list. Huh. That's strange, dude. That's how it works with default, I suppose. Determine value. Strange. Strange, strange, strange. Well, that, this is not intuitive. Sorry, I'm still on the uh, screensaver. But this is not intuitive. But essentially what I was able to do is render out the struct value. Let me just comment these out. And you see it in raw form. So now I just need to get into those. Maybe create a custom template for it. And to read the docs a little bit closer, basically. I feel 2.7.1 docs. Or you can close. All right. So for blocking such and such, then you display the value of that. Uh, then you can include the block block. Include block block. So essentially, you can. So I'm wondering if I can just do title here. I, if I don't have to define a sub template, um, it might be a little bit cleaner for now. Uh, um, since I'm in the context of a table already, it'll make it more explicit here what my markup means. Whereas if this wasn't a standalone template, it might be a little bit more confusing. Let's just see if I can get that title in there. There we go. Okay, so essentially you gotta get the block value, then you can iterate over the fields. All right, it's a little bit confusing, but Sure, there's reasons for it. So, in other words, dang, value. Arthur's. Talk page number. Let's see if this works. 
Yeah, all right. <laughs> a little bit closer there. And then the authors is also it's a sub structure, it's a list block. So we will just need to then for author and for author and authors author. I think you have to do that still. Uh, comma. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be janky. I've done this before though, but if you want a comma uh, delimited list, you need a comma space or NBSP. not work all right that did work very client but notice we have a comma with no other authors uh, where did I use there's the thing you can check if you're at the last element of a for loop I think I used them in a magazine author template inside of the for loop. I think that'll handle white space properly, maybe not. That way at least you don't get a comma with one. And now if I click it, oh, the page turn doesn't work. So let's check console, warning, cookies. Mm, yeah, I see why we need the inner archive identifier so we could reconstruct the the iframe basically. Let me see. Or debugger, that can be a debugger. So I'm just checking if my click event is working, if it's registering or not. It is, and we have our local context. We don't have a page number, so that would be the issue. That's the problem, I mean, <laughs> not to confuse with the archive issue. issue so. um, right. And this comes from the page itself, the deep archive issue, which has the corresponding Internet Archive ID. So I think if this page turner thing works, debugger, we got the page number and all that good stuff. Nice. Go and play it. And it turns the page. Oh my goodness, it worked. And the editing experience is a lot better here. Having this uh, nested field, it's a little bit verbose and big, uh, a lot of white space, but. Uh, maybe that makes it a little easier to navigate. Uh, oops, oops. And there, I might be able to improve this by adding horizontal layout. Um, for example, these page numbers don't have to be full width. Uh, but for now, I think this is a pretty good uh, stopping point. What are we at? A little bit, just at one hour in the stream. And that's kind of what I was after for uh, this evening. Just something simple, a few commits. Quick experiment to see if I can get us back on track here. So let's see. 
and migrate all this all these changes here what did we change so that's a migration for adding table of contents field which i think worked out this one was for removing <laughs> so i actually didn't have discipline on my commits i'm gonna have some janky commit messages and i bought all these well shoot i'm just gonna do a big old fat one say switch to stream field i'm actually gonna clean up that model here too we don't need that Yeah, just like one or two commits. One for the model. And block and one for rendering it. As table and you can click on the whole table mary did want a signifier so let's just do that it's a small thing uh you know you can click anywhere on the row it'll work um, but let's go ahead and just add a little bootstrap button view that live close that out you know just right over here on the left hand sidebar or something uh because it kind of doesn't really indicate that clicking should do anything right uh, i could change the cursor for example uh, let's make this a little more compact too and maybe collapsible but not so not so important so table small i just have to look those up i don't remember all that kind of stuff and then i kind of like the striped tables I think they have stripe table still. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. Table stripe to add zebra striping. Cool. Let's see how compact we can make that. A little bit better there. And we'll add, so let's see. change the CSS so the whole row indicates it would be a clickable thing but mm. so an extra thing there and then what a th tr td excuse me the button uh, this is actually where font awesome would be good I'm gonna do I'm gonna try the font awesome one more time Let's just see how the buttons though I think default should be good it's gonna be a little bit catching thing can you tell it's a button primary then yeah and so it looks like the actions on the button but it's on the whole row <laughs> that's cool uh, I mean I could just put the action on the button but in any case uh, let's try this wagtail font awesome one more time I think it's gonna be a general improvement had some problem importing it mm, it's already present okay so just need to change the the config and this was where I was really confused uh, basically we have our WF website has our main configuration our base configuration and then you can oh it's already there all right it's not complaining so I must have fixed that or had it I think I had the problem on a different project I'm working on like three of these wagtail projects at once so let's see 
Oh yeah. I just remember we're using this Wagtail Font Awesome for a while in the in the Western Friend website because we have it in menu icons and all sorts of good stuff. All right, so it's moved to GitLab. So let's go there. And what am I looking for? How do I use it in the template? So essentially, you just include these these two tags somewhere in your template. Mm. Either I would do this in my base HTML or on this particular template. I think this is a good place where this would be the base HTML. Somewhere at the end here. I don't know if this font awesome CSS should go in the header though. Oh man, did that just change every line in my thing? I think it lent it in. Now I have a huge change. Look at that. Every line shows it's changed. Okay, well, whatever. I'll honor the linter. Uh, let's just then, yeah, so it's going to add that link here, and that's the right place for it then. then. I can just add something. Just copy this for convenience. Nice. Yeah, so it's going to add this font awesome CSS helper. It's just going to create that link. Some yada, yada, yada stuff. I wonder if it does the integrity deal. Probably not. I can check, though. So we're done here, we're done there. Uh, let's save um, FA. Um, this is totally a guess, so probably is wrong. Run the server. Mm. So on my base HTML, I've got to load the tags, then I can, all right, I did it out of order. Let me open the file. Uh, I basically loaded the font awesome tags at the end of the template and I try, um, thinking, just, oh, I wasn't thinking correctly. You need to essentially load these helper tags before you use them. Um, so I'm just, I don't know. So, but now this, these helper tags are, are defined for Django and then I'm using the Find out some CSS. Maybe I'll just load the thing there first. There we go. Now it should work. Oops. All right. So I got the obviously didn't select the right uh, icon, but if I look at our elements and I look in the head, I can then see material design, find out some CSS. It's actually loading it from our own deployment so hmm, interesting okay so let's just look up and it's font awesome four it's not font awesome five uh, view icon or I view all icons is fine and I want the I and it's just I so that's a simple and obvious name probably would have been the next thing I was gonna guess Do XS. That's pretty making the row pretty tall. Oh no, no, that doesn't work. Did they remove that in Bootstrap four or whatever I'm using? Let's check the sizes. Alright, so we like the outline because it doesn't it's not too bad, or I could use secondary or dark. Secondary might not be bad. Uh, doesn't matter. So you just have small. All right, well, I'll deal with it. Okay, so let's see. I, mean, 
think this is good. File text O. And actually, I want to. I wonder if it's enough just to have the icons there. <laughs> Maybe. I know this won't work for screen readers. I think that's a whole other thing in terms of accessibility. Uh, I don't know how we would even have that PDF. You'd have to go to the, um, the Internet Archive to render that PDF properly in the screen reader, I believe, because these are just basically static images if I do that it's just one page of JPEG -y <laughs> text on the Internet Archive though I think they've handled the accessibility it'll even read it to you uh, we actually I should bring that up to Mary that uh, read the book aloud let's see if I do advanced audio properties Doesn't seem to be working. No, I don't have any audio. Huh. All right. Loading audio. It's not working. So that would be cool, though, if we could link the audio reader into our page. I mean, that would be super, super awesome. We'll work it out. All right, so this I think is fine. I don't know if it needs the text or not. I mean, the text doesn't hurt really, to be honest. And that would help screen readers because these, are, otherwise, these icons don't mean anything. So at least. Uh, I'm not going to fiddle with it. I'll get feedback from Mary. She's much more, um, oh, has better insight into the visual design of things. So I just wanted to make it work. All right, what did we do? So add font awesome. And then render view button. Very cool. Just a little bit after an hour. So yeah, looking good. A little bit of an improvement. The editing interface doesn't look like hot garbage anymore. The end user's perspective with the table of contents looks a little bit better. Um, we got our interactivity working and the, the, you can get to the Internet Archive to view the item. I think this is uh, good. Uh, good progress and I'll get feedback on it tomorrow I meet with Mary once a week and while we're developing this project well actually we've been meeting for six years now once a week pretty much it's pretty cool working on the Western Front website overall and this new project has been under development for about one year okay well this has been a code buddies live coding session thank you all for joining on twitch if you're checking this out on YouTube please do feel free to give me a, any suggestions or questions.
questions down below the video and I will try to respond promptly. Uh, if these uh, live coding sessions are a little bit long for your liking, I do try to summarize the work I did uh, from each session into less than a 10 minute recap video, usually around 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the amount of work done. So if you notice the, I've been tagging each of these live code or recap, uh, and you'll notice the time difference. Live code is just me working stuff out, figuring it out, scratching my head, sometimes having conversations, and uh, recaps are succinct explanations. But this is about Code Buddies. CodeBuddies.org is an open source community for helping each other learn to code uh, and build cool things together, basically. The CodeBuddies.org website is also under development. So if you're wanting to get involved with an open source project from the ground up, do stop by CodeBuddies.org or GitHub.com slash CodeBuddies, or you can check out the open source projects where we're rewriting the platform. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Great day.